I was at Derby County as an apprentice, so aged uh, 16, 17, two years full time at Derby. Um, then I went to Bury for a year. Uh, went to Sweden for a year, played for a team called Husqvarna FF in Sweden. And then I came back and had uh, one or two injuries that weren't decisive on their own, but uh, sort of contributed really to the fact that, you know, the, I realized that I wasn't gonna have a, a career at the level I wanted to. And uh, therefore, you know, it made me think about um, going into coaching. I, I felt that if I started early enough um, then I could become a better coach than, you know, pro probably I would have had uh, a career as a player. When I was at Derby, um, we used to do uh, one session a week for, in the community program. That the, the lads actually got a couple of extra quid for doing from the club. And uh, I enjoyed it. And then I got involved with independent centres of excellence at the uh, Cheshire Football Development Scheme. Uh, in Macclesfield, Wilmslow, Northwich, and th those areas around Cheshire, Trafford. And um, again, enjoyed, it was enjoying it more and more with a higher level of kid. Uh, at the independent centres, it was more selection rather than just, you know, you could pay to come on a course. Um, and then it went from there, really. I was less than 45 minutes from Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Everton. But also, you know, if you're moving downwards, um, you know, Aston Villa, the clubs in the Midlands, West Brom, Derby, etc. So a real hotbed of football, and um, yeah, a good place to, you know, good place to to learn my trade. Really, already had um, experience full time um, as a youth coach by that point at 21, and uh, I think at the time only Graham Taylor uh, had been younger to get the, the award or the equivalent award. It was the full badge then. Obviously now it's the, you know, the UEFA A. So uh, yeah, it was pretty clear straight away that this was, uh, you know, the best, best road for me. I recommended a player that was taken, which sort of got me, got me in. And um, then I was invited to watch some training. I was invited to take some training. That became one night, became two nights, became three. An opportunity full time arose, and you know, I was um, you know really keen to do that. So um, that's really how it came about. As far as my development was concerned, I mean the the beauty of the period I was there was that I experienced. Um, coaching under six, under seven year old kids in the pre-academy, right through to the senior team and, and everything in between. And, um, you know, being able to see, um, you know, seven, eight, nine year old kids eventually playing at 21, 22 in the Premier League, which happened with a you know, reasonable level of frequency, um, you know, was a great education as to, you know, what it took and what was required at certain age groups um, to go through and be, you know, become a player. So players like you know, Danny Murphy and Dean Ashton, for example, um, you know, that had been with the club you know, from a very young age, um, to see them develop all the way through, um, you know, was, was you know, particularly satisfying, firstly, but also very educational. You can tell young in terms of, the, the, there's the physical aspect, which is really decisive in terms of your observation, in my opinion anyway, um, and with somebody like uh, Dean, Dean wasn't very good physically at um, 13, 14 years of age, but technically he was you know, fantastic, struck the ball very cleanly with both feet. You now, good, 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 good quality footballer, but we weren't sure how he was going to evolve physically and uh, heavy, not athletic. Uh, his mentality was good, so you thought he had the mental attributes that normally, you know, if you have those as a young player, you know, that's, that's how you will be as a, uh, you know, as you mature uh, into a man. Um, what Dean did do was he worked very hard at improving his physical condition and 16, 15, 16, 17, 18, you could see that, you know, he was, um, he was gonna be fine physically, which was really the defining point with, with him. Of course, at, at crew in the championship as it was then, you're in the first team early. So, uh, you know, 16, 17, those boys were getting experience in the championship at a good level. 
in uh, in Danny's case, um, more obvious earlier that physically he was going to have good attributes. Technically, of course, again, you know, you, you don't need to be uh, Einstein to, to see talent. You could see the brain, you could see the talent. The big thing really with Danny was the mentality. He had strong opinions on what the first team were doing, never mind what his team were doing. So you can never be sure with the opportunity that they get. And of course, injuries can, uh, you know, come into play. But both really were a good bet from a, fair, a fairly young age that, you know, they would go on to have good careers. Um, at, at that time at the club in the, in the championship, there were seven, eight, nine, ten players from the academy playing in the first team every Saturday. And um, at one point we were um, seventh in the championship, so just on the brink of the playoffs. We played Leeds United on uh, New Year's Day at Leeds, won the game with ten players from the academy in the first team. And at that moment was probably the, the closest that, that we got to, you know, the, the full dream being alive, if you like, of you know, going into the Premier League with a team of completely homegrown players, which, of course, you know, won't have happened before or since. Um, unfortunately, players were sold afterwards. It was the January window, Dean being one of the most significant ones there. And um, you know, the team fell away and you know, the rest is history, as they say. But I think being part of that, the culture that that creates uh, at your club, and when we, when we recruited from outside, you know, those, those players quickly embraced the strong culture that you know, had been developed. So you know, experiencing that and, and uh, seeing that and the, and the advantages that that brings, um, and I also had a big part in, in, in you know, my evolution as a coach. I had joined Stoke as the academy manager from Crewe, who really wanted me to do a similar job there to the job that I'd, I'd done at Crewe. And um, right at the end of a six-month probation period, which was standard fare in the contract, it wasn't something that, to be fair to Stoke, either, either they or I had asked for. Um, I had a phone call from, um, from Chelsea, from Frank Arneson, asking me that, you know, would I be interested in taking the reserves, which is what it was at the time, not the 23s, it was the reserves, and working closely with Carlo Ancelotti on, you know, they had a group of kids, uh, Daniel Sturridge, Fabio Barini, um, there were a few others, Josh McEachran, Patrick Van Anholt, that uh, they felt could evolve and, you know, progress and uh, there would be times where they'd be training with the first team, but there'd also be times where they'd be playing with the reserves and they wanted somebody who had experience of development, but also working with senior players to see if um, you know, they could you know, fight, bridge that gap, if you like. So uh, I have to say Stoke were very good. It was only two or three days before that six month probation had finished. So it was easy in, in effect in that there was no compensation or anything you know, that was necessary. And um, you know, I did I did a week at uh, at Stoke, and then went down to went down to London. I mean, at that time, it was a little bit different to, to as it is now, even. Um, but a complete contrast to life at Crew, where you know he, he, all the kids were from one hour away. So um, you know, kids from Liverpool, kids from Manchester, kids from the Midlands. Uh, at Chelsea, it was a global um, you know global group. I had Gokan Torre from. Turkey, Jacopo Sala, Fabio Barini from Italy, Patrick Van Anholt from Holland, um, Daniel Sturridge, of course, who was English, but had been at City all of his uh, career. So um, a completely different ball game in terms of uh, understanding the different personalities, the different cultures, finding a way of communicating and getting through to players. Totally different challenge, um, but one that I enjoyed and one that really stood me in good stead when I... You know, I had the opportunity to go and work with the first team because Chelsea is a, an English club playing in the English league, but is very much a, a European club in respect of you know, the, the, the players and uh, the coaching staff usually that, that are involved working with the team. So I think that was a vital, um, vital educational period that I had that definitely helped me when I progressed into the first team. Every morning I was in the, um, the, the staff meetings as to what the plan for the day was and which players would be in which group and what the content needed to be with the players. 
There were times where I took sessions with Carlo and uh, particularly the, the, the second half of the season when uh, Ray Wilkins had left, uh, had a bit more interaction then. So, you know, a great experience working with a top level coach who had very clear ideas on how he wanted his team to play. And of course, a very exciting time at the club anyway, because um, Carlo managed to achieve the double in his first season. Um, so being around that and uh, you know, being in the dressing room at half time, which is a privilege that I was allowed, and uh, seeing, you know, seeing how the players behave, the coaching staff behave, the communication at half time, and then of course seeing the team play was uh, you know, a great experience and fantastic for my development. I was actually on holiday with my wife in Spain and got the call after day two and returned home on day three, which uh, she still uh, reminds me of regularly. I was asked to come back. I came back. I met Andre and Roberto De Matteo. And um, Andre went through you know, what he was looking for and his ideas, and um, which were you know, quite different, really, to the direction the team had been in before. Andre had just won the treble, I think, with Porto, unbeaten all season. So an incredible impact in his first year as a coach. Of course, Chelsea is you know, quite a unique club. There were a lot of senior players around at the time and uh, you know, it was a, a, a really challenging season um, with Andre trying to take the team in a different direction. We had results at the start. Then we hit a spell where we didn't get results. And um, you know, that, that, that became difficult. And there was kind of a breaking point really as to you know, whether the team needed to change direction in terms of the, the direction they were being given. Um, or if, if it was continued, then it, you know, it was likely that the, the, the targets that it was uh, you know, trying to reach would, would not be achieved. And at that moment, obviously, the, the club made a change. That's a big club every day is a drama. And uh, you've, there, are exper there are examples of that now with some big clubs, frankly. It's never quite as bad as it's made out to be, is the first thing. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, this was um, a group of players who'd been used to a certain direction on the pitch, a certain way of playing that in the past they had had some success with. And, uh, you know, that, that really is the breaking point. If, if, they can, if the team is getting success with something that's different, then uh, you know they can buy in, they buy into the ideas and things can run smoothly. If you don't get the results, then of course that doubt starts to creep in. So really, it was a case of trying to um, you know reassure that it was the right pathway. It was certainly something that originally Andre had been you know brought in to to introduce a different way of playing, and um, and then obviously communicating as an assistant, you're always communicating with the boss and trying to act as a buffer with the players and uh, filtering back, you know, feedback. And so that the whole thing, you know, trying to give the whole thing the best chance of working. Um, so I guess from a selfish point of view, going through that was a good experience because, you know, football, football isn't all beautiful. It's, there are these moments and uh, frankly, your ability to handle these moments in the end are decisive. It was the, uh, atmospherically the best night of my eight years at Chelsea. I think there was a, a real connection between the supporters and the players. The players were incredible really at that period because um, for many of them they'd been you know, trying to win this holy grail for many years and uh, you know, time was running out, frankly. That night we played uh, a, a Napoli team that had arguably the most dangerous three forwards in European football at that time. And a real counter-attacking team with Hamzik, Lovesi, Cavani as three forwards playing in a 3-4-3 system. So you know, we, you're chasing the game, so, so you, you know you're going to leave spaces because we had to commit players forwards to try to rescue the scoreline. We needed to score three. But you knew that, that was, there was going to be a risk with that. You know, we got ourselves into a really good position in the game, if I remember rightly, 2-0. Uh, and then 2-0 became 2-1, which doesn't look anywhere near as good. But then the third goal takes the game into extra time. And um, it was a night really where the big players you know, stood up in terms of not just the goal scorers in that game, but uh, also the performances. I think if I'm right, it was Ivanovic who 
who got the decisive goal in uh, in extra time, which uh, which sent the club you know through to the quarterfinals. And I think it's safe to say at that point you you started to get the feeling for the first time really that you know maybe eventually after all the bad luck that the club had had. When I think when you think of the penalties that weren't given against Barcelona and losing in injury time, you know the last kick of the game with uh, Iniesta, um, in all those moments, penalties against Liverpool, and finally maybe you know it was it was uh, Chelsea's turn to get the rub of the green. It was an incredible period because the games were coming thick and fast, and um, obviously getting to a cup final, you get the extra FA Cup games that you have to play as well. So we were, I remember after the, um, after the cup semi-final against Tottenham, where, um, you know, the, we had a magnificent result, we're in the final, but there was no time to celebrate. Uh, on, the, on the coach, on the way back to uh, Stamford Bridge, we had our laptops out and uh, we were studying Barcelona because in, in, you know, the following morning we had to deliver the game plan for Barcelona. We played them in two days. Uh, as soon as you navigated the Barcelona game, there was another. So it was a relentless period. Um, even the final, we couldn't really enjoy. We beat Liverpool in the FA Cup final, but it was actually at a time where it wasn't the last game of the season. And we had Liverpool at Anfield, bizarrely, that was we played three days later than the cup final. So, you know, we just, just had one of the biggest nights of your life. And, you know, the next morning we, we weren't, celebrating we were out on the training pitch preparing the team for the next game we looked at the four games as a block of games and we it was impossible that one group of players could play every minute of those four matches something somewhere had to give we made nine changes at arsenal and uh, still managed to get a draw and then uh, it meant the team was fresh in the new camp for the second leg and of course we lost a player in the first half in that game ended up playing you know an hour with 10. So in the end, those things are, when you reflect, those things are decisive. So an incredible experience to go through with an incredible group of players that, I mean, that night epitomized it really. They, they refused to accept defeat. The first leg was tactical and uh, very cagey. And uh, we felt Alves would really attack from right back. So we played Ramirez on the left, which is, was different. And uh, Lampard recovered a ball in midfield, played Ramirez in who was behind Alves. He crossed for Drogba to score 1-0. The second leg uh, was not tactical. I remember Roberto had said to me, have a look at the opponents always for the first couple of minutes of a game and let me know what, what you see. Is there something different to what we've prepared? He would be focusing on us. And uh, after two or three minutes, they'd changed. They'd played, they, they were playing differently. They were playing three and a diamond and then a front three, which we'd half expected, but was different. And I remember him asking me after two minutes, you know, what, what are they doing? What are they playing? And they, they had total control of the game and were already wave after wave of attacks. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, Jesus, I think they've got 13, Robbie. Never mind you know, what system are they playing? Um, we're two down. Uh, we have a, a man sent off. There's 100,000 in the stadium. We've got Ramirez, who was a midfield player, playing right back. We've got Bosingua, who was a right back, playing centre back. We've already made three changes now in the back four. So you, you're sitting on the touchline looking at the clock, thinking, you know, this, this is going to be painful. Um, and then just, just before half time, we got a counter attack, and Ramirez produced a sublime bit of ability to chip the goalkeeper for 2 1. And that was huge because it actually meant that what we had, we could keep. It was now about trying to defend because I think to try to defend, but also try to score, we would have in the end come unstuck, uh, the space that we, we would have left. And uh, in the first half, we'd played 4-4-1 with Drogba alone, but we were getting outnumbered in midfield. The, the midfield players were outnumbering our two central midfield players and we, we couldn't get any sort of stability. So at halftime, we played Drogba on the left and uh, we played with three midfield players, Mireles and um, uh, Lampard and Mikel. And we tried to control that zone. And I have to say that that worked and uh, gave us a chance. It gave us a chance of keeping the ball out the net. Um, what it also did was it meant that we could never get out of a half because there was no reference as a forward. So we were set for 45 minutes. We were camped in a penalty area. 
And uh, arguably the greatest rear guard action ever by any team in any game, in my opinion. I know I'm biased, but you know, it, it was the ultimate challenge, really. And uh, a little bit of luck, a penalty miss, and then that incredible moment, you know, two minutes into injury time where for the first time in the whole game, my neck turned to the opposite end of the pitch. And uh, suddenly this yellow and white flash and Fernando Torres was alone with nobody within 30, 40 meters of him. And only really when, you know, the ball went into the net, did, did we feel at any time in the two matches that we really had a chance of getting through to the final. So a, an incredible moment that will stay with me forever. The Saturday before our last game of the season, Bayern Munich played Borussia Dortmund in Berlin in the German Cup final. Me and Robbie went, Mr. Abramovich provided a jet. We went straight from training, door to door, watched the game. Dortmund won 5-2. They played 4-4-1-1 with Lewandowski and Kagawa and uh, soldiers on the wings to control Ribéry and Robin. And we took this from the game and, and thought this was our way. We, uh, our, our Lewandowski and Kagawa was going to be Mata and Drogba. And uh, we had four players suspended for the final. Uh, Mireles, Ramirez, Terry and uh, Ivanovic, so four big players. So we had to try and find a way with the other four midfield players of creating what Dortmund had really, which was you know, really compact, strong, defensive, two banks of four. So uh, we, in training, we tried Ryan Bertrand, who was a left back on the left wing. And um, long story short, that looked good in training. He, he and Ashley were one in, one out. And, and we felt that was the best way of controlling Larm's forward runs and uh, Robin's positions inside. So amazing, really. You play your Champions League, make your Champions League debut in the final out of position. But uh, he, he came through and um, obviously we managed to get Didier's late equaliser that took the game to penalties. And uh, Peter Cech, bless him, with a, a couple of great saves. And then uh, Didier, the, you know, the man to, to, to strike the kick, which was very apt, I think, to win the, uh, to win the Champions League. So you know, an amazing experience and an amazing achievement by an incredible group of players, frankly. It was a privilege to be involved with them. I didn't know Gareth, and he came into Chelsea w with Andre, funnily enough, when Andre was the coach. And um, I, we met and we spoke a little bit, and uh, I was go explaining to him the coaching session because he'd come to watch. And then I, I, uh, he, he came to see me not long afterwards and uh, asked me whether I'd be interested in um, taking one game for the under-21s with him, which was his first game with the under-21s. And uh, Jose by then was the head coach. And Jose very kindly you know, didn't stand in my way. At Chelsea, uh, during international break, there are no players because all the players are internationals. So for me to miss 10 days during international break was nothing, really. We only ever had two or three players left, if that. So uh, a good opportunity to go and experience something different and, of course, to know some of the better English young players as well. So I could see that from the club's perspective. We won the game. After the game, Gareth asked if I would be interested in doing the role more, you know, with, a, with more consistency and across the season. Again, Jose was kind enough to allow me to do that. And that's really how it started. Um, uh, we did uh, three years, I think. And then um, out of the blue, really, the opportunity arose to go with the senior team. We had three days prep before we were into two qualifiers. And uh, you know, another chapter was, was, was to begin off the back of that. When we got the opportunity to take the job, uh, we needed to win a couple of games and, and see. And we won a couple of games and got the opportunity to do that for longer. During qualification, we went to Malta and uh, qualification, we were navigating fairly straightforward uh, in that I don't think the team was exciting, but we were winning the matches and qualification looked like it was going to be achieved. And we went to Malta and that was really when it struck me for the first time. Um, the, the, but the coach was pulling into the hotel and there was a lot of England fans outside bars driving 
on our way driving through. And they were giving dogs abuse to the team. And this is before the game, not after the game. So there, w there was a real disconnect with the England fan and the team. I think it's just something that had evolved over a period of time, frankly. And um, that, that was really the part of the challenge, the challenge. I mean, it's something that I think Gareth has handled magnificently is that, um, you know, the, the, guys, the guys do want to come. They do want to play for England and they do want to give the English, the English people a team that they can be proud of. And uh, the, those messages slowly have started to come through. I think certainly that was the case with the World Cup in Russia. The team felt, uh, the nation felt that they actually quite liked the players. Add to that, I think that um, we evolved the way of playing from qualification in the finals. We didn't, we, we didn't like the 4-2-3-1 that we'd used in qualification. The team was stodgy. It was solid and we always had a threat, but the football was stodgy. And uh, neither of us really had, had ever wanted that type of football in my career or Gareth's career as, as a coach, as a player. Certainly with the 21s, we tried to play a different way to that, so, which is where we came up. We went to the, um, um, uh, the Confederations Cup in Russia the year before the World Cup. We did a lot of miles in the air, looking at potential training sites, watching teams. Portugal were there, Germany were there. So um, trying to get to grips with the nation because the country is so vast um, and also analyzing teams. And, and it was really there that we decided that we felt a back three was going to give us a better chance of keeping clean sheets, but also you know, a basis of a way of playing with the players we had. Um, three midfield players we felt was going to be better than two because we'd been playing with two in qualification and that hadn't looked right. Three brings in a Delhi or a Lingard. Two is hard to play Delhi or Lingard in a two, they become wingers then. So we were trying to find ways of getting our most talented players on the pitch in a way that gave them their chance, their best chance of showing what obvious qualities they had, whilst also giving us a chance of being stable without the ball. So that's really where that uh, came from, the 3-5-2, with Raheem playing behind Harry, which is what you saw in the World Cup, really. Um, we had um, fantastic quality at wing back, and we played the wing backs very high. So Trippier and Ashley Young, and Danny Rose sometimes on the left, um, and then Harry as a reference. With really, I mean, we had Jesse, we had Delhi, we had Raheem all playing fairly free, you know, in behind that structure of two wing backs wide, and, and Harry as a as a reference. Behind that, some stability in midfield with uh, Jordan, and then three central defenders all of which really could come out with the ball. Um, Harry Maguire, we really picked ahead of one or two others that were playing at bigger clubs, frankly. So now Harry Maguire playing for England, everyone's got their head around that. But at the time, that was a big call. But his comfort on the ball was fundamental in that. John Stones, we all know, can play. And then the final part of that was Walker playing in a back three, which wasn't too dissimilar to Aspilicueta playing in Antonio's back three. And um, frankly, very similar to what Pep had been asking him to do with his club anyway. I think with Liverpool, the fullbacks, they maraud forwards. With Manchester City, more positional. It's more the wingers and the number eights that maraud forwards. So uh, we, we felt that what we were asking him to do for us wasn't really dissimilar to what he was doing with his club, which is really fundamental with all of those decisions because what, what hadn't happened in Iceland against Iceland was, or what had happened was, under the pressure, the players had fallen apart a little bit. I think that's fair to say. None of them played close enough to their level. We felt that to get that back under the pressure, that we needed to create a situation where the habits that they had would be strong and they'd have comfort with. And because uh, normally under pressure, you will resort to type and whatever your habits are, that's where you'll head. And, um, we felt that if, if we trained this enough and played this enough, that the habits would be you know, strong enough when the pressure came, which was, again, a, a large part of trying to get round pegs in round holes. Through the group stage, I mean, that, I, I can't say enough really how the importance of, of that second goal against Tunisia. 
because if you if you win the first game, you breathe immediately, and you know that if you can get a result in the second game, you're done. Um, if you don't win the first game, the pressure then goes to the second game. So that that was you know, fundamental, really, in the um, in terms of the the comfort of the performances and the, and no drama with the fans. You could see the momentum growing. There was no doubt. Now we were several goals up at half time against Panama and after one and a half games, we're through. The third game then it allowed us to change some players, which at the time got a bit of um, criticism, which is understandable. But in actual fact, there's no doubt that that helped in terms of the, you know, the progression of the team beyond then. The Columbia game really was the decisive one in two ways. One, if we were to win that game, it would be the first time we'd won a qualifying game for God knows how long. So that would have broken that barrier. And the second barrier, of course, that we broke that night was the penalties barrier, which um, was again a huge, I think, mental step. You could see from that moment onwards really that it was less a case of, you know, what, what might go wrong and more a case of, okay, now what can we do? You know, a, a different mental feeling of confidence. Um, the Sweden game historically a game that England had always suffered against, you know, against Sweden. Our record in major tournaments and qualification was a disaster against Sweden. This is a team that historically always make it really difficult. And we were really about as comfortable as you can be in a quarterfinal of the World Cup, which doesn't get, that gets underplayed a little bit, really. Uh, many people would put Sweden in a lower category of club and dismiss that as being a game we should win, but that hadn't been the case historically. Um, so the players deserve credit for that. They made a difficult game, you know, relatively straightforward, which was a credit really to the way they played. I think every, every game, every game I've ever been involved with, where we haven't won with any team, uh, you always reflect afterwards on. There's always something that, if you'd have done it, might have made the outcome different always something in every game. And uh, we reflected afterwards, um, we made some observations and uh, you know, they will remain private, but always, always after every game, I think, I think it's to improve and to get better and to gain experience is important that you, know, you don't just shelve the game and move on to the next. It's, uh, we did analyze it. We have, um, you know, have our own views on in that situation again, would we do certain things differently? And um, I think that's part of the process, frankly. Prior to the World Cup, I'd seen England in two semi-finals in my life, uh, Euro 96 and Italia 90. So we think we're a great football nation, and frankly, we are in a way, but two semi-finals in 50 years doesn't really reflect a great football nation, let's be honest. Not when you balance that with what Germany have achieved and the fact that nations like you know, Denmark and Greece, I think, have won you know, European championships. So immense pride on reaching a semi-final. Um, and then, of course, you know, in the summer with the Nations League, we managed to reach another semi-final. So it was two, it's now four. So that's good. Um, but of course, you know, when you're so close, um, you know, you, you suffer, it hurts. And... Uh, the next day at the training ground, I mean, we had a um, fantastic facility and, uh, in St. Petersburg with its own grounds. And really, we were always in our own grounds. But that, that day, I had to get out and uh, just have a little bit of time you know, to myself, frankly. It was, uh, the disappointment was immense. Um, balanced with the pride of getting there. But when you get so close, you know, it hurts. And I've got to say, my... My experience of life at Chelsea really has taught me that, um, you know, it's, it is about winning. It's about winning and uh, that, that winning mentality doesn't include, you know, feeling sorry for yourself or making excuses. That winning mentality means, you know, you, 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 you analyze and, and then push to do better next time, um, which is, of course, what we're trying to do. Um, I think what, what, we all, what we all want to do, all of us involved with the team, is give you know the nation those those moments of happiness that were evident during the World Cup uh, in Russia. We weren't at home to enjoy them, 
We were a long way away in the middle of a forest somewhere. But we'd get back from the game against Sweden, for example, at 4 or 5 a.m. There was some food put out for us in the, uh, in the restaurant area in the hotel we were staying in. Uh, and on the big screen, there was, I think BBC were running um, sports news. And they were, they were going from Newcastle to Carlisle to Southampton to Liverpool to, and these images of you know, England, English people um, watching the screens out in the sunshine, celebrating the moments. Um, you know, it's a humbling experience to feel that you're, you're part of something that can give that. And um, you know, th those moments were incredible for us all to see really, players and staff. And uh, you know, the challenge is to try and do that again in the summer and take that you know, even, even one step further, which would be you know, the first final England will have played in, in my lifetime anyway. <laughs>